up, everyone? This is a little different. I'm not going to be up on the stage because there's so few of us that we can all just, you know, gather together. We can be close. We love y'all. We love each other. So, but before I start uh, in tonight, guys, um, real quick, I am just going to pray real quick. Uh, we're going to uh, lift up prayers for the prior family real quick. So um, if you will just uh, bow with me again, we're going to be uh, in prayer for them. Um, Father, I humbly come for you now, Lord. God, you are good. You are so good even when we can't be. God, right now, I, um, you have always promised to be near and dear to those who are brokenhearted and those who are hurting. God, I ask that you be with the prior family. God, I ask that you will be near and comfort them. God, I ask that you will, you will be near them in this time of pain. God, we have seen time and time again that you show up when we are at our lowest and when we're hurting. God, I ask that you show up for them, that you be there, and that you comfort them. And God, also be with the families that they have touched or they have impacted, God, that, that, you, will, that you will strengthen them to be able to care and to also be for them when they are not able to care for themselves or when they feel hurt. God, bring others around them to comfort them. God, I thank you for who they are and what their family has meant to so many. They've blessed so many. God, I pray that you will be near and comfort them. God, I thank you for who you are and what you continue to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, guys. Well, like I said a second ago, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently because there's so few of us tonight. So I thought I would be on the floor and be among us and we can have like, a better talk, and it's a little bit, you know, I'm not on the stage, I'm not away, but we can all kind of come close to each other because we love each other. So we're going to be now on the floor. Um, so real quick, uh, how was y'all's week? Did y'all have a good week? Was a Valentine's good? Yes? No? No? Well, take comfort in knowing that if you had a bad Valentine's Day, that chocolate is now a percent off. And so you can go find solace and comfort in chocolate and sweets. So... Exactly, and also find comfort in knowing that the Easter candy is among us. It is in stores as we speak. So if you're looking for that Reese's saved egg, it's here, it's now. Um, but like I said earlier, um, my name is Tyler Webb. I am the Associate Youth Director here, and uh, if this is your first time here, I'm excited that you are here. What's up, Janisha? If this is your first time here, I'm excited you're here, but if not, thanks for keep coming back. So before we start tonight, I need to ask you a question. Is there any trends in your schools that you recognize? Now, before you all shout out, what I mean by trend is, oh, everyone has this shoe. Oh, everyone wears this brand of clothing. Oh, everyone has this haircut. Is there trends that you recognize in your school? You can shout them out. What's up? Stanley, Stanley Cups. That is a growing one. What's up? Birkenstocks, those are here and they're happening. What are the other trends? What? Self-tanning, that is also a trend. That's also happening. What else? What are other trends that you recognize in your school? Everyone has bought Ugg slippers? Interesting. Yeah, so those are all great answers. Trends are something, and it's also refreshing to hear that, because that lets me know, too, that trends are still the same as they were when I was in high school, and that they will always still continue to be there. But when I was in high school, trends looked a little bit different, and there's going to be some leaders in the room who are like, yeah, I recognize all those, and all y'all are going to be like, what? There's no way those are real things. So um, with that being said, here is the first picture of a trend that I had while I was in high school. This is... This is the Nike Shocks. It was a big shoe when I was in high school. Everyone who was someone had a pair. And so, and I don't know if it's like the Springs and, and they're making a comeback. Like I looked it up online and they're making a redone of the shoe. It's been kind of shut down for a while, but they're coming back. But this wasn't the only thing that was like a big trend in our school. Now, before I show the next picture, I gotta kind of like prepare you. All of y'all right now know that we have, what is it, the iPhone 14 Pro Max? Is that like the latest phone? But when we, <laughs> I don't know, I, don't, I just use it to call people. But when I was in high school, the iPhone wasn't even a twinkle in Steve Jobs' eyes. And so this is the phone that we actually have when I was in high school. Yes, it was, 
everyone's like, whoa, is that really a phone? No, it really is. It's the Motorola Razor. And it came in a variety of colors and it flipped. And all of you are like, why would a phone flip? That makes no sense. But no, you can't touch it. You, you can't, like, there's no touch screen on it. You have to, like, click the button three times to get the letter you wanted to send a text. But that is one of the phones that we had. And it was a very popular item. Everyone, when they got their first cell phone, when you even could get a cell phone, you're like, oh, I want that. But that wasn't the only phone in the package deal. This is the other one. And this is the T-Mobile Sidekick. Now, what was so cool that everyone loved about this, and you may be like, that was really a phone. It looks like a gaming device. But I promise you it was a phone. And what was so cool about it is that the screen flipped around and revealed a keyboard like that. And kind of, you kind of felt like a secret agent for a little bit. You kind of had this, like, it was the first time you had like a computer in your pocket and you could like literally like type on a full keyboard and not like just the, like the old school texting where you hit the button three times, like I said, to get a, a, a character. But that wasn't the only thing that was trending when I was in high school. So talked about shoes, talked about phones, and I'm going to skip clothing because if you went to high school with me, it would only be like American Eagle or Abercrombie. Like those are the two big clothing brands when I was in high school. But we're going to go straight to hairstyles. Now, who in here would recognize this person? Now, hopefully, hopefully at least everyone knows who that is. But this is young Zac Efron. This is Zac Efron when he first came on the scene of when like High School Musical just came out. And as you can tell, when he like kind of like got into acting and when he came into uh, his role as uh, Troy and he was on the basketball team, he brought with him this kind of side swoop, kind of right over the eyebrows, but you're still kind of grungy. You're, you're still letting it grow out, but it's all going one way. You're kind of swooping it over. And he wasn't the only one to kind of like bring this hairstyle to life. Justin Bieber kind of rocked this for a bit, but it was, it was happening. This was a really big hairstyle. And if you were in my high school, it kind of ran like rampant. Like this was a high school, this is the hairstyle that everyone had, which this is actually a prime example A. So, so this is me when I was in high school at my senior prom. And as you can tell, like, as a, uh, like, like, the perfect right over the eyebrow, it had to be right over the eyebrow, all the hair is going one direction, there's no part, it's all swooping towards one side. This was like the hairstyle, and this is like the epitome of it, of what spread through my high school. This was my senior prom picture, and I tell you, there was more guys that had this haircut than didn't. It ran rampant in my high school. But those are just a few of the trends that were going through, and I'm trying to tell you about trends because it's the same way as when I was in high school as when y'all are in high school now, they're gonna keep coming. Last week when Jeremiah spoke to y'all when we started this whole series, he, he kind of brought up this point that you are made on purpose and for a purpose. You're made for the relationship that you could have with God. But when we don't have that relationship with God, we're trying to chase down other things. We're trying to fill ourselves with all these different areas that we want to be felt, we want to feel love in and we're chasing all of these different things and so the way that all these trends start and the way that the trends are a thing is that these companies see that we are made with that kind of god-sized hole in our heart and they want to produce all these things they want to try to get your attention no matter how they can and they're going to keep making things to try and fill that void and you're going to realize that as you keep chasing all these things that won't fill it's only going to end in kind of a meaningless search and as we started this series, as he said last week, we get into February and of course it's Valentine's season and it's that time. So we have to realize that as we're chasing down this feeling of wanting to be loved in all these different areas, of course it's gonna spill out into our relationships, into dating and also into the pursuit of sex, whether in marriage or out of marriage. It's all gonna come out in these ways that you're gonna chase these things and want to be loved in those areas. You want to feel like you are loved by something. And so that's why you find these trends. That's why you find these areas of where you feel like you fit in or you're acknowledged by doing all this, by pursuing all of these things. And so as we, as we kind of move forward, I want you to kind of think to yourself that this question, I really want you to ask and really think about this question. And that question is, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice? What is it in your life that you could give up to either start a relationship or to start a friendship? Or what are the things that you will not budge on? That's the kind of question that you have to come to yourself and, and wrestle with. 
You have to ask that. Because if you think about it, in the example with the phone, if you're getting a phone just to be like everyone else, you don't want to stand out. You don't want to be alone. Or if you're thinking about the example with the shoes, you just want to clothe yourself. You want to put on what everyone else is wearing so you don't stand out and you're not alone again. You're trying to avoid this feeling. You're trying to chase after this acknowledgement or chase after this friendship or just what everyone's doing and you don't want to be left on the sidelines. So you, so you get all these popular items. You get all these things that everyone else is doing so you feel like you're involved in something. And it can go that much deeper. Those are just kind of clothing, but it can go a lot deeper. If you have a group of friends who are influencing you to act how you've never acted before, but they, they cheer you on and they applaud you and you feel like you're accepted, then you're like, oh, well, yeah, if they think I'm cool and, and I, of course, do these things that I don't agree with, but I'm gonna keep doing it because they make me feel loved. Or maybe if you're a guy in the room and you don't, and you kind of downplay how you treat others or how you treat women, because you see that it's like funny on TV or you see it's funny on movies. Or maybe if you're a girl in the room and you start to feel this unimaginable weight of what social media calls beauty and you chase after that. So you try to change yourself to match that image and you're just exhausted at the end of the day because it, it's, un, it's impossible to give but social media keep puts, keeps putting it out there. And of course, we're all gonna chase it because we want to feel involved. We wanna feel loved. And so that's what we're all getting at. And so we start to begin to lose or give up these parts of who we are, of who God made us to be, all to fill the void that we think everything else we can get in our life will fill other than Jesus. We try to fill it with all of these other things in our life. And so, but as, we, as I asked that question earlier, what are you willing to sacrifice? As we begin to get in scripture, as we get, get, begin to dive into the content, we see that when we come face to face with God, when we're in a relationship with God, he doesn't ask us to sacrifice the good parts of us. He doesn't say, give up being who you are, or who I made you to be. No, the only things he asks you to sacrifice or the things he wants you to give up are parts that are gonna be bad or lead you down a path that you don't wanna go. It's ultimately the parts of you that he wants you to sacrifice are the parts that don't lead to life. Nothing that you're giving up when in a relationship with God is ever going to lead to life. Lead to life. It just won't. When He's trying to change you, it's all for your better. It's not that He's changing you into something to fit in. He's not changing you to be a part of this friend group or in this relationship. No, He knows exactly who you are. He made you that way. He's not going to ask you to give up who you are or who He made you to be. He is trying to only magnify the image of God that you already have deep inside of you, whether you try to hide it or not. You can't give it away, it's there, and you can't hide it. There's nothing you can do about it other than live in that freedom of who God made you to be. So as we come to scripture tonight, we're gonna be in uh, 1 Kings, and before I kind of uh, dive into scripture, before I pull it up there so we can all follow along, I wanna kind of give some context about where we're gonna be at and who we're gonna be talking about. So as we dive into 1 Kings, we're gonna be looking at the third king of Israel, and his name is Solomon. Everybody say Solomon. Solomon. So Solomon was the son of David, and David was the second king of Israel, and he was kind of a big deal. Like David was the one who was called from being a shepherd and chosen to be a king, was, let, was called to lead his people because the first king just did not wanna follow God. And so David was called from uh, his family, from being a shepherd. And the first thing we even see of David is he defeats Goliath, who was a giant that the Philistines were trying to scare and intimidate the Israelites. And David said, I am going to defeat you, not for my people mainly, but for my God. I am gonna challenge you and strike you down in the name of my God. And that was the first time we see David and he steps onto the scene. And after that, everything is just a blur from David going to, to being brave, to defeating lions, to defeating these different armies, to conquering these places and to being and following God. Now, David had his flaws. David was not perfect, but ultimately we all know him in scripture as the man after God's own heart. That's what we know him as. And that's also how he led his people. He always was putting God first, even if he messed up. Even when he failed, he still repented, he still confessed, and he came back into a right relationship with God. And that's how he led his people. So now as we're thinking of Solomon, and as he's trying to fill in those shoes of his father, it's kind of intimidating. I mean, the last thing that David said to him on his deathbed was to be strong, to act like a man, and to obey everything God had told you to do. And it's short and simple, 
But if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about your father who went and conquered all the lands that you now own, and also he was pretty much one of the greatest warriors that Israel has ever seen, that's a lot to, to kind of follow up. And so to kind of solve that, God comes to Solomon and he's like, I'm gonna bless you. Ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. Ask me for anything on this earth and I'll give it to you. And Solomon, and he could have chosen anything, he could have done anything, but as we see in Solomon's early life of his value of God, he said, God, I want wisdom and the ability to lead my people. He said, make me wise because I'm trying to follow in the steps of my father and there's big shoes to fill. And if I'm gonna lead my people well, I need to be wise. So please bless me with wisdom. So we see at the very beginning of his life, Solomon is valuing and chasing after and worrying about his relationship with God first and foremost over everything. But where we're gonna be at in scripture is a little bit later down in his life and we start to see that things have changed. Solomon is now king. He's a little bit later in life and money and influence and all of these things have started, his notoriety has grown because of how wise he is. All these things are starting to change and we see what Solomon's values also change with them. So real quick, if you have your Bibles or if you're following along or if you have the Bible app on your phone, uh, we're gonna be in 1 Kings 1 and we're still gonna read the first four verses. So if you have that, you can follow along, but if you don't mind, uh, throw it on the screen. And it says this, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They are from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. So a few things to point out before we really dive into the wisdom of the text, and I know it's a small passage, but there's so much to unpack there. The first thing to point out is that this God saying not to intermarry with the other nations is by far not at all a racial thing. God is not against interracial marriage, but he is 100% against picking up and worshiping other gods, worshiping idols that are outside of what he has asked them to do. He is 100% against all of the acts that come with idol worship. One of the uh, races of people that uh, Solomon was uh, intermarrying with, they had a practice with their idol worship where they would actually practice human sacrifice. And God was like, I don't want this anywhere near my people. So do not even bring any of their gods or the people who worship their gods among my people because it's only gonna lead you away from me. So that's the first thing to note as we dive into the text. But the second thing to also note there is that just because God allowed it doesn't mean God approved it. Solomon is always gonna be one of the biggest cases for that because we see that immediately in the, one of the first sentences it says, he loved many foreign women, and it ends with he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And we think like, whoa, 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 well, we know in the New Testament, it's two people become one flesh, and they, like, it's only two people involved in the marriage. <laughs> what is Solomon doing here with 700 becoming one flesh? It's not okay, and just because it's in the text does not mean it's allowed, because immediately that should have been a red flag to everyone in here. Like, whoa, what's he had doing with 700 wives? That makes no sense. There's no way that could ever work out. And so as we see, it's like, it's like a situation where you might get away with something and nothing happens. You're like, oh, well, that was kind of cool. I might do it again. And I might do it again. And you keep trying to push the limits until finally you get caught and all the piled up consequences that you've been avoiding all come against you. And that's what we're basically gonna see in Solomon's life is that he may have married 700 women, but it wasn't like it was ever allowed by God. And all of his consequences were immediately gonna catch up with him. So now that we kind of got that out of the way, let's start to begin to dive into the wisdom of the text. So the first thing that I want to point out is at the end of verse two, where it says, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Now, Solomon being the king of Israel, he was also a devoted follower of God. So he would have known all of God's laws and he was also the wisest man of his time. He was all of these three things, and yet it says, nevertheless, he held fast to all of his wives in love. So what that's basically saying, if we were to sum it up in like our own words, that's basically Solomon going, 
all right, God, I hear what you've told me. I hear that you've called me good. I know what scripture has to say about me, but I'm really gonna go chase after her and then her and then her. And then her, I'm not gonna say it 700 times, but that was basically what Solomon was doing. Is he saying like, look, I hear what you have planned for me. I hear that you have good things for me, but she really loves me and I really wanna chase her. And I think we can make it work. I think it's gonna be good. I think I will honor you at some point, but I, I, I'm gonna go chase after her. That, if we were to like break it down in our own words, that's basically what Solomon's saying, is that no matter what God has done or what he's created you to be, at that moment, Solomon's like, that's all good and well, but I'm gonna go my way. I'm gonna go pursue in the way that I think I should pursue. I'm gonna go chase after this relationship and I don't care what it costs me because I'm so in love with her. Nevertheless, he held on to love. And that's one of the first things that we see in this text is that he gave up what he believed in because he chased after that relationship. Like, do you ever get that? Like there's times in, your, in my life at least and maybe in your life too where maybe you say, God, I know what you've said about me. I know what you've called me, but I don't think you made me funny enough. And this, these people, even though this friend group, even though we find humor like putting other people down, at least I feel funny. So I'm gonna chase after that. I'm going to live in that and I'm gonna pursue that relationship because at least I feel whole in that. At least I feel complete. And I don't think you gave me that last little bit I needed. Or maybe it's even a point where it's like, I don't feel loved because I'm not the most important thing or I'm not getting this or I'm not getting that. But this, this person, this guy, this girl, or this group of people, this friend group, they're giving me that. And God, I'm gonna pursue that. I'm gonna chase after that. That's what this per- first part is, is that we're trying to say that satisfaction comes from where we want it to come and not actually from God, and it doesn't matter what we give up in the out- outcome. If we keep chasing after all these fake sources of love, we're going to keep ending up with the same empty pit of desire, and we're always, always going to wonder, why is anything working? I've chased after all these relationships, all these things. Why am I not feeling satisfied? That's what Solomon felt, and that's the same thing we'll feel if we keep going after these places where we know we won't be filled. So that's the first thing that we see in the passage. But the next two pieces of advice that I wanna to give to you from the passage come at the end, uh, or come out of chapter, or verse four, which says, as Solomon grew old, his wife turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. So of these two uh, pieces of advice, the first one that I want you to know, and no matter if it happens early in the relationship or later on, but you can always tell their relationship is fake and not ever gonna end in anywhere near what true love feels like in God is if they begin to give you an ultimatum. Everybody say ultimatum. Ultimatum. That usually ends and comes about in the worst four-word phrase in human history, which usually comes about in, if you love me. It's that simple. What that's gonna look like is someone's gonna use that phrase and then they're gonna ask you some just ridiculous thing to try and prove your love to them. They're gonna say, well, if you love me, you'll give up your Sunday nights at youth to have more time with me. If you love me, you're gonna give up your friends because I don't think they're cool and I need you to just walk away from them. If you love me, you'll cross that line that you drew up in your mind about our relationship because I need to feel love. If you love me, you're gonna do what I want because I need to feel loved. And so you're gonna hear this emotional manipulation and it's gonna be this time where you have to actually have a reality check where you're like, whoa, why they asked me this? This came out of left field. I don't think this is how love should be. But then as you're so wrapped up as, like Solomon, as you're so in love with whoever it is, you're gonna say, well, I guess I can give that up. I guess I can make that change in my life because they, they love me, right? Like, I feel it from him, so yeah, I don't need that. Yeah, that friend group, I don't need it. I need them. I need whoever I'm in love with, whoever, whatever friend group I'm in love with. That's what you start to see. That's what you start to think, and you start abandoning all that God made you to be, and you give up who you are and who God called you to be because you are feeling loved in this friend group. But not only that, if you are chasing after these areas of love that's just not true and fake, And one of the easiest ways to avoid 
all of this headache and heartache, and this may come as a shock to some of you, but honestly, if there are unbelievers in who you're looking at as a dating partner, I would take them out. I would not have someone who's a non-believer in someone you value or who you want a relationship with. And I say that because at the end of the day, if you can tell me, if you can just rattle off, oh, well, she's fantastic. Oh, she's so smart. She is loved by everyone. She's like the greatest in her sport. She is the whatever. And I go, well, does she love Jesus? And you're like, well, well, no. Then I hate to break it to you, but she doesn't need you. She needs a relationship with Jesus first. That's first and foremost. Or maybe you could try and like reason with me or bargain with me. Like, no, 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 you don't understand. I can change him. I can bring him to Jesus. I can do all this. Really, a relationship with Jesus is gonna be the first thing you bring to him when you're trying to make Google eyes and like, like focus on relationships. Like that's really gonna be your focus. Like, like it's all a joke, but I'm serious. Like when you're pursuing a relationship so hard, and you let a relationship with Jesus become the back burner, and you're so focused on making that relationship work, it's gonna be a long and hard road when you, later on down your life, you take a step back and look around and be like, first off, you're not involved in a church. Secondly, you're not around any of your old Christian friends. And, the second, and thirdly, you're just like, how did I get here? And it's all because you try to be the main source of God in this couple, in this relationship, and it's just so hard of a burden to try and carry. And now you can try and make it work. If you're fully convinced that they are the one and they are like, they're the one meant for you, then focus on bringing them to church. Focus on bringing them Jesus first before even a relationship is even in the conversation. All those things need to happen first, but one of the easiest places to save so much heartache and headache is just to not think of non-believers as a possible dating candidate. It's just not gonna be easy because they are not gonna wanna bring you to the sources of life. They're not gonna guide you or encourage you to make hard decisions in your relationship with Jesus. They're not, wanna, they're not gonna be there when you need that support because they don't have that faith. They don't have the same life-saving faith that you rely on so hardly in your life because they don't understand it. And so if you're gonna to try to be the only one either in that friend group or in that relationship, it's gonna be exhausting. It's gonna be full of heartache. I'm just trying to warn you. That's all I'm trying to do is to give you this piece of wisdom. But luckily, as, as we end that small passage and we see that kind of end of Solomon's life, we, it doesn't end there, thankfully, for all of us. Solomon ended up writing another book in the last stages of his life, and it's called Ecclesiastes. And it's in this book that he's coming to the end of his road, and he's, he's looking back and thinking of everything he did and everything he gained and everything he amassed in his, in his rule and his reign over Israel. He starts looking at all the riches, all the women, all the places he's conquered, all the uh, political agreements he's made with other nations, all the things he's done on this earth, and he counts it all as nothing compared to God. He counts his relationship with God as the first and foremost thing that he ever thinks about. And we see that his life came full circle, thankfully, from how he started with asking God for wisdom of all the things he could have asked, put God on the back burn in the middle, and now at the end, he's able to say, at the end of his book, it's a summary, I'm summarizing for you, but basically he says, all has been written, everything I can think of, God, obeying God and following him is the most important thing in this life. That's what he came to realize. That's what he came to see. And that's what we need to see in following Solomon's example. Because when we realize that only Jesus satisfies and we begin to have a fulfilling relationship with him, then when we begin to see that the people that we bring in or the people that we pursue, if they aren't bettering us or leading us closer in a relationship with him, then they're not worth it. And that sounds harsh, but I'm serious. If, if you don't have people pouring into you and pouring in life, then it's gonna be a hard, lonely road because you're not gonna get better in relationship with, with Jesus. You're actually gonna fall away. So you want to surround yourself with people who build you up in that, and you also wanna pursue in a relationship someone who builds you up in that. And Solomon, one of the things that Solomon realized too is that the people who bring in who don't glorify God, who aren't trying to build you up in that, are trying to ask you to put on or take away pieces of you 
that are made in the image of God. Solomon realized that all the people and all the women he was bringing into his life weren't leading him towards a better relationship with God. They were just trying to chip away and take away his God-given image that he had and that we all have in here. And so really, I want the main thing I want you to hear, if you hear nothing else tonight, I want you to truly hear that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Every bit of you. Every bit of you is made by God. He knows you. And listen to what it says in Psalm 139. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Look, I get it in middle school and high school, and especially, well, mainly high school. I'm talking about only high schoolers. In high school right now, I get it. It's hard. You want to try to fit in. You don't want to be the standout. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to feel like you can't be loved or no one loves you. And so you do all these things to fill in that void. I get it. I've been there. I, like, I showed you some like joking trends, but like, there's been other parts of my life in high school where I wanted to fit in, where I like, did the dance and got like, the hug to say, like, look, I'm a part of the group. I'll, I'll do whatever y'all are doing too. I just, I want to feel loved. I don't want to be cast aside. I get it. I truly do get it. But as we start to really think about what satisfaction feels like, and we know that only God gives it, we can't continue to chase these areas of love in our life that just aren't real, that will never lead us down a path of true satisfaction. And so as we begin to start this process of really like taking a step back and examining our life, the first thing I really ask you to do is to start by taking a look in the mirror. And what I mean by that is when you're in front of a mirror, it doesn't reflect the attitude, it doesn't reflect the friends, it doesn't reflect anything else that you try to put on or cover yourself with or try to put on this fake mask and try to act out this relationship. No, it's you alone with God in front of that mirror and you're having to face yourself and actually make some hard decisions. And so the first step of that, of when you're actually looking in the mirror and taking some time to reflect, I, I ask that you take a second to ask if it's worth it. And what I mean by that is that when you're thinking about is it worth it, what, truly look at yourself and ask, am I tired of carrying the burden of having to feel like I have to change myself or to fit in or do something? Am I tired of carrying the weight of having to live up to other people's expectations? Like, is that not exhausting? Like, do you even, re like, if you were to take a step back and look in the mirror, do you even recognize yourself anymore? Are you so invested in, in a relationship or a friendship that you've covered every bit of who God made you to be? Your identity, your ideals, everything's thrown away because you're so invested in that area of trying to get love, of trying to feel like you fit in? Do you even recognize yourself? Is it worth it, the choices you made, the people you've clothed, like put around yourself, or who you're trying to date? Is it actually worth it? And if it's not, if you can actually say at the end of the day, if it's not worth it, then let Jesus come in and fix that mess. Let him come and try and sort out and bring you back to who he made you to be. He wants to. He wants to come into that mess and sort it out. He wants to be a part of every step of the way if you will let him in. If you will let him in and begin that process. But if you let him in and try to sort out the mess of trying to get back to who you were created to be, then you also have to take the next step of letting him work out in the relationships that you've already made. And so the second thing I want you to do is to start to look at who you surround yourself with. <coughs> and what I mean by that is when there's a proverb that says, bad company corrupts good morals. And basically what that means is whoever you're around, you're automatically gonna start acting like them. And to even prove that, there's a study out there that says you are the average of your three best friends. Now, if you actually think about it, would other people around you say that's a good thing? Like, are you seriously picking up the traits that make you who you are from them that are good? Are you picking up their worst traits and there's nothing good to pass on to anyone else in, the, in your life. Like seriously, what are you picking up from your friends? Who are you around? Who do you surround yourself with? Because ultimately you will pick up what they do. You will pick up their habits. You will pick up some of their mannerisms. You will start to look and act like them. And so the last thing that I want you to leave with and the thing I want you to know the most is that not only should you look in the mirror and look at who you surround yourself with and ask yourself, is it worth it? But I want you to ultimately remember that you are an image bearer. 
You are an image bearer of the God of the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are made in his image. At creation, he looked at us and he said, we are very good. And then not only that, Paul writes in his letter, he says that we are God's workmanship. Another translation says, we are God's masterpiece. Like, do you actually believe that? Do you actually think that you're God's masterpiece? Because I guarantee you the places that you feel that God left out certain qualities, that's where his power shows up. All your shortcomings that you think you may have, that's where God shows up 10 times more. Everything that you feel that you've been left out or not given in life, that's where God shows up. That's where he amplifies his power in your life is at times where you feel that you're not enough. And so if you, for you to bring people in and try to change you out of who God made you to be, it's just not a smart choice at the end of the day. It's not something that you should feel like you want to choose that. At the end of the day, finding satisfaction in Jesus will only benefit your life. There's nothing that's worth giving up than giving up your, like, your life to him. There's nothing else worth more than that choice. Giving up your life to him is the greatest choice you will ever make. And there's nothing that can ever change you to be any better than being in a relationship with him. So ultimately, I want you to know that God sees you. You are his child. You are in his image. He knows you as a son or a daughter, and he only sees you that way. So if someone tries to tell you that you have to do this or to prove or to do anything else otherwise, they're not worth it. And they're not going to ever build you up or build your relationship with him. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you'll pray with me real quick. Father, I come and come for you now, Lord, just thank you for this time. God, thank you for this uh, ability to come together and worship and to be in fellowship in your word. And God, I pray that as we head to small groups now that we will be able to interact and to confess and to be and tell anything that's laid on our hearts. God, I pray that you'll be with the leaders and that you'll be able to give them the strength to be able to guide that moment. God, I thank you for who you are and who you continue to be in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guys, you're good to go to small groups.